Well, I have been especially looking forward to this session for two reasons. One is that Our Mutual Friend is my favorite Dickens novel. And two is that I have long wanted to hear more from Karen Hathaway, who for many years has impressed me as a member of the board of the Friends of Dickens. She is currently distinguished professor at San Jacinto College North. Is that the right pronunciation? Yes, you know, I practiced and practiced that. And when I got to Texas, they pronounced <laughs> San Jacinto College. <laughs> okay, San Jacinto. Right. By my calculation, she has been teaching there for 53 years. Is that correct? Just about, yes. Right. That's wonderful. Karen completed her master's degree at the University of Oklahoma. And at the time she was working in, at the University of Oklahoma in the Office of Advanced Studies. When she heard that a new college was starting up, San Jacinto, Jacinto. And she called up the college and who answers but the president himself. And he gave her the usual line, don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> but Karen received the first of several professional surprises uh, when in fact she got a letter from San Jaito offering her a position in the English department. <laughs> so the rest is history. Her husband, David, at the time, facilitated the move because he had started an engineering position at Deer Park Shell Refinery. Among Karen's other achievements is that she started English as a second language at San Jacinto. And I know having uh, gotten uh, foreign students over the years, how dearly I would have enjoyed to have access to uh, uh, English as a foreign language. <clears throat> now, Karen received her second big surprise when she passed, but I presume got a good score on the graduate record exam. So she applied to Rice University to their uh, PhD program. And her third surprise was that she was accepted. <laughs> uh, since then, among other accomplishments, uh, Karen was chosen by the League for Innovation in Community Colleges to write the Cross Papers, number 18, which was a monograph and has been probably influential in the teaching in uh, uh, community colleges. Karen, I'm not sure what cross papers are. Well, they're the person who was uh, a leader in making community college instruction oh. a legitimate activity was a person named Kay Patricia Cross. And she wrote a lot, a much, and taught much to faculty about setting up classes in ways that you could assess the students' personal development as well as their academic development. Mm -hmm. Great. And so the league, she was part of the league, and the league set up a competition, an annual competition for people to write monographs, basically in her order, in her yeah. honor, but uh, on the topics of teaching faculty connections and so on. So, Sounds great. Yeah. High schools could use something like that too, believe me. Yes. <laughs> and Karen received, I, I noted, her PhD from Rice in 19... 83, mm -hmm. when I finally got my PhD, I have come to believe that the only reason I got it was that the faculty 
were sick and tired of seeing me. <laughs> and they realized the only way to get rid of me was to let me have the degree. <laughs> <laughs> they go to the library. There's Wayne, <laughs> library, yeah. Karen, just delighted to have you chair these sessions on our mutual friend. Thank you so much. Well, I'm so glad to do that. I hope everybody feels that way after, <laughs> after this session and then proceeds on to the next. Um, I'm going to share my screen and look at. I think, can you uh, enable screen sharing, Gordon? Try, try it again. Okay. Oh, yes. Here we go. Okay, so I'm just titling this Considering Our Mutual Friend. And uh, these are, are just um, conversation guides, um, ways to think about carrying on our conversation in a way that keeps us focused on book one. If that's very hard to do, but there's much in book one that makes it a very rich introduction as pretty much is the case with all of the first pieces of Dickens' novels. So I thought we would start uh, with that. And again, remember, I'm just turning away from you, not because I don't want to talk to you, but because I have a second computer screen here. So I thought the afternoon would be if we want to introduce ourselves via the chat, that might be faster, but we could also introduce ourselves. I wasn't sure, uh, Courtney, how you managed this so that everybody kind of knew who was there, uh, but we could do that just quickly from with folks who want to introduce themselves. If we want to just do that orally, that would be fine. What do you suggest? Um, well, I think it's really up to you. We have um, 48 people, so it might okay, take a while to do it orally. Okay, maybe the chat would be would be quicker. And I think, yes. So if you would introduce yourself uh, in the chat and tell us something about what, what interested you in the novel, uh, what, what you find astonishing or annoying about uh, uh, the first book, focusing pretty much on the first book, but generally why you're here, okay? So can we do that for a couple of minutes and then we'll, we'll look at the chat together, all right?
Well, I'm going to say welcome to everybody. We'll come back to the chat and look at um, uh, more at who's here and your observations about uh, beginning beginning together. Um, I have a sort of loose uh, agenda for our conversation, and many have already um, anticipated it. I'd like to locate the novel for us. This is Dickens' last major novel, the complete one. Um, it's strangely similar to The Mystery of Edwin Drood, which is the unfinished novel. Um, it comes at a time when he was uh, involved with Ellen Ternan and also involved with the dramatic reading of pieces of, of his novels. Um, and that was taking a toll on him, on his energies, his psychic and uh, literary energies, but he seemed to gain something from giving his characters, interestingly enough, his own voice. And so that's, that's a perplexing part of Dickens, uh, Dickens' life and of his understanding of himself as an, uh, as an artist and as a commentator. I'm not sure that that has a lot to do with our mutual friend, except that we see in the novels that he chose uh, to work to do the dramatic readings, that, that there were often uh, some social commentary uh, and they were quite dramatic where he could take, take the scene um, and, and make it come alive in ways that were quite disturbing. Um, we can locate this in a time of change. This is the uh, 1860s. It's a time of change in, in British uh, life. Um, it's a time when classes were, were changing. Instead of the inherited titles, we have the people who could make, it was based on money more than as much as title. And we see that in the, in the wealthy, the, the, uh, the veneerings and the other, the other families that are wealthy. And we also see it in Mr. Twemlow and we see it in the Wilfers where there is a mother who, who takes on heirs as if she is a, a, uh, an upper class or at least almost upper class uh, woman. So we can locate the novel that way. I think for a 21st century reader, what's interesting in the novel, and we're not, we haven't gotten there yet, we almost get to it in the very last chapter, uh, Dickens includes handicapped characters. And so in our time where we're thinking about uh, inclusion, uh, we begin to see some, we see something in Dickens that we've not necessarily seen before. So, Let's think about the characters themselves. And what characters stood out to you in reading book one? Let's start with the ones that just kind of leapt from the page for you. Remember, you'll need to unmute yourself or just take a minute to see what you thought. Because I can piggyback onto what you thought. Anybody have a thought about that? What characters? Liam? Yes. Liam? Oh. Uh, uh, so, so well, I, <laughs> take some of the video in as well. Um, I, I, I think an obvious one is Silas Gregg. Uh, he, he's yes. just is just really striking. I mean, personally, I quite like Eugene and Mortimer. I think they're really interesting as 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 sort of heroes to follow through the novel, or, or you know, and um, but but Silas Wegg is is just fantastic. He, he grabs you from his arm. Right, right. That's true. That's true. Uh, certainly, he is. Uh, as we care, think about these more, he is the uh, uh, Larsenist one. He is interested in coming up in the world, but he also is one is a literate character. And we have to think about how that literacy uh, both is, makes him ridiculous, but at the same time has some influence. Hey, Phyllis, what do you want to join, uh, suggest? Um, I, I think the Boffins are really interesting. Um, 
and and, it, and I put this in the chat. It's also um, their part. Their, this whole idea of different ways of being couples, and um, and then you get the veneerings, and then you get who is my best friend, and mm -hmm. Ben Twemley saying, "Oh, am I his oldest friend? Oh no, she's his oldest friend." And right. so you get these people, and maybe that's part of what you're talking about. This whole uh, dissolution of of a hierarchy, and so then people are swimming around trying to figure out which school of fish uh, they belong to. But also, it, it it seemed to me I was ready for the boffins to be totally skewered. Uh -huh. um, but they're not. They're good, kind people in a way, um, in their own way. And so Dickens has me off balance a little bit as to maybe I shouldn't be making assumptions about other people. And the last big character, which is in almost you know all his London novels, is is the river. And um, yeah. right, yeah, that's right. Yes, and I'm glad you're thinking of the river as a character. Right. Thank you so much for that. Anybody else want to share your ideas about characters? David? I'm interested in the way Dickens starts the novel. Okay. He's doing something that he also did in Little Dorrit. Mm -hmm. First chapter is giving us atmosphere and right. a glimpse at the themes. Right. Second chapter, he gives us a group of people and we as readers are trying to figure out who am I supposed to be interested in? Who am I, who's going to turn out to be important? And we get this, we get something that's very uh, movie-like in yes. running a camera's eye over a group of people and describing them. And only slowly do we begin to figure out who what's going on and who's going to matter. Right, and I think that's that, just to be puzzled. Yes, and I, I think that's really interesting. And since you brought up the beginning, let's take just a minute, if you don't mind, to just dip into the language of that for a moment. Uh, in these times of ours, so considering the exact year, there is no need to be precise. A boat of dirty and disreputable appearance with two figures in it floated on the Thames between Southern Bridge, which is of iron, and London Bridge, which is of stone. All right, think about that. In an autumn evening, in an, as an autumn evening was closing in, somewhere between the iron of industrialism, the stone, perhaps of more uh, traditional uh, the traditional bulwarks, perhaps, of, of British or anybody's society. And we don't know what in these times of ours, exactly where that is, because for a reader of the 22nd century, we could say, uh, sorry, in the, in the 21st century, we, we could say to ourselves, well, you know, the bridges, stone and iron, you know, I might make something more about that, but I can think a boat of dirty and disreputable appearance. You see, I live in Texas, so mine would be uh, someone immigrating, do you see? And yet the immigration, even though that's a, a 21st century problem, the immigration works as the various characters are immigrating from, from, uh, from one thing to another uh, or swimming around trying to figure out what to do or sure they know what they're doing, um, but maybe don't. So that's 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 a great observation. Thanks for that. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, so any other characters? We've got Wegg, we've got the Boffins, and I think you're right to say that the Boffins are, we think they're going to be the ridiculous one. They're actually not at all. They take on strange. Identif identities though, and as we get closer, a full, more fully into the novel, the masquerade of the Balkans is uh, interesting too. So anybody else? Yeah, I, I don't seem to be able to raise my hand digitally. Oh, okay. Well, just- Peggy. 
Right. I like Mr. Twemlow. Yes, right. I think it's his commentary is the I don't know. It's almost like the narrative, but he's so unegoistic. It's it's like this is what people really think as opposed to what they think they're supposed to think. Mm -hmm. And so I really like him. Okay. Irene, what do you have? Uh, I'm fascinated by the character Venus and this oh, yes. idea that he spends his life creating skeletons out of a variety of bones and his interaction with Wegg about his wooden leg. I found this always absolutely fascinating, this character. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Wayne? You're, you're still muted. Hi, Wayne, turn on your microphone. There you go. Yes, I'm very impressed by Lizzie Hexham. Yes. Mm -hmm. From the very first, because I don't know if any of you have done a lot of rowing, but she not only rows the boat and her father, she sometimes rows against the, the current. Yes. So she is a very strong woman. That's right. <laughs> and I, I, I find that it's sufficiently rare, just a wonderful right. factor. And she's brown, so apparently she's suntanned. Yes. Right. Like a working woman. Right, right. So, and uh, I don't think I'll give away too much if I say that this no. first chapter is a marvelous foreshadowing yes. of what happens later. It, it is just it is. fantastic craftsmanship. Right, because the what's happening in this this chapter is going to be almost repeated. I absolutely in one of the ending chapters. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And that is fascinating. Okay. So can we can we pair or group the characters in some way that helps us to to sort of figure them out. Let's let's take Mr. Twimlow. That was suggested by somebody. Can we connect him or observe his disconnected state to tell us? Well, we can't connect him to somebody, right? He's Lord Snigsworthy's cousin, right? And so so he is connected loosely to a person uh, of the inherited upper class. All right, so he is, uh, and the big question is whether or not Lord Snigsworthy's family is in town or not. And Twemlow seems to know. Okay. Any other pairings that you think of? Lizzie Hexham, who would we pair her with? Well, she's paired with her brother, right? And her father. Um, eventually, she is going to be, be paired with, with someone else. And then that's uh, the gentleman who is beginning to um, become interested in her, fascinated. And I think, Wayne, he's fascinated in her by her, her stillness and her capacity to be her own person and her strength. I think that's that's part. Yes, Trudy. Well, I don't want to interrupt, but no, please I, do. Please uh, but one of one of my favorite characters in this book is um, Abby Patterson. Yes, yes. And I think you could pair Lizzie with her too, in a way. Yeah. You've got a couple of very capable women. Um, who uh. Um, you know, who are, uh, I don't know, I think among the strongest, I mean, certainly Lizzie is and, and uh, Abby is, is one of the strongest women in Dickens. Right, right. And she, um, you know, I'm interested in her job too. I mean, uh, being, being the the keeper of the pub, yes, uh, right. which which becomes an intersection, you know, right. So um, anyway, she's my choice. 
Oh, I think, and I think so. She's uh, she's very very interesting. I'm not seeing that other hand. Somebody else has a hand up. Are you seeing a hand up, Courtney? Uh, Row. Hey, right. Yeah. Nobody's right. mentioned the the heir. You know his name. He has many names, but um. Right. What's what's his, What's his most common name at the moment? I, I can't remember his name. He's got a lot, but he's, he in fact is um, the, the heir of John Harmon. So he's right. he's probably, as far as getting the plot going, he, he's kind of the guy that's gonna propel the plot from beginning to end, I would think, because his hiding his identity um, is kicking off the plot. And you know, I like the part where he's, it's a little, I'm jumping ahead a little bit where he's stuck because he, he, um, he wants to tell his, to tell Will, uh, Ms. Wilfer, what's her first name? Well, anyway, names are hard for me. Bella. Bella. The, the lady, Belle, he wants to tell Bella uh, that he's in love with her, but he's really, I love the, the di dilemma that he says, well, if I tell her, she'll marry me for my money because she's so uh, money grubbing. Right. And if I don't tell her, she probably won't like me. <laughs> so he's not telling for the moment. And I, and I love that dilemma. So that, but he's, yeah. you got to yeah. mention him because he's a pretty important character. So that's all. Exactly, exactly. And he is actually, a witness in some respects to his own murder. Yes. He comes in as, I forgot the name right, Nicholas Hanford, is that correct? Yeah, I think so. And he comes in and, and uh, uh, offers some evidence to the police. And that's where he, he meets, he sees uh, Mortimer Lightwood and then has to avoid being seen again by Mortimer Lightwood. Liam, what have you got yeah. there for us? Yeah. Uh uh, I, I was just going to say, uh, to point out, because people might not uh, have realised, I mean, officially, the narrator hasn't, Dickens hasn't told us yet who that character is. So I, I, was, I thought it's a good point to say, um, some of us are reading it part by part. I, I've read it all before, but it was 40 years ago. So I read mm -hmm. exactly to where we said, uh, and for a lot of us, we'd probably like to avoid spoilers. Or, or I'll just read the whole thing from next meeting, but you know. Right. Right. Um, I, I mean, I always I spotted what was happening, but but so it's a good borderline case to pick up on spoilers, whether we want spoilers or not. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think been more than strongly hinted at. Yes. Oh, no, it is, but I don't think he's actually said yet who the main character is. Maybe he has. I don't think so. I think we have, except for the absent John Harmon. That might be. Anybody else think that there's a main character so far? I have one that dominates this. That's it. Hi, Phyllis. Uh, no, go ahead. Um, I wasn't going to answer that, but um, so if somebody has an answer to that, I'll wait. <laughs> well, just so far, not not for the whole thing, but just so far. So. So far, what do you think? Who do you think the main character? We could because we get we are yeah. just inundated with characters in book one. If if this was a detective novel, which kind of is, um, more more to my light with the detective at the moment. That's who we're following through the story at the moment. I yeah. think. I think he is. Uh, we do have the inspector who is is kind of following along, but Lightwood is the one, right, Glenna? Right, right. Miss Mason. Uh, I think Bella, Bella, Bella Wilfer. I'm cheating a little bit, but yeah. she's one of Dickens. We've met her enough to know that she's very number one. Self, she describes herself as being totally mercenary. She's totally cruel, which we often, not often, but I've seen in other Dickens novels where a young man's in love with a cruel woman, and she seems right. to be the cruel, cruel woman. So I don't know that she's going to be the center, but she's an important person and one of the major characters, I'd say. Exactly. And she's also part of the will, a part of the inheritance. Yeah. Yes. That's true. Right. Yes. And, and the Boffins have taken her in. The Boffins seem to be, you know, they're kind of gathering together a lot of the people in the story so far. So yeah. her living in the Boffin house, along with this um, man whose name I keep forgetting, but John, I think I'm John Harmon, but anyway. Brooks, uh, Brooks uh, yeah. Yeah. Mr. Smith, Mr. Brooks. Brooks, Brooks Smith. Smith. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I I can see how Dickens is gathering the troops, so to speak. I mean, physically, you got to get them together to have interactions. So, you know, sneakily, right. I see him 
uh, you know, gathering them up in the Boffin house. So. That's right. That's right. Phyllis? Uh, yeah, um, I, I'm going to play, do a little play on your question. I keep thinking uh, a comradeship, um, uh, the, the name of the, uh, the pub, uh, yeah. the, our mutual friend, uh, Twemley's wondering where he fits in the social order of friendship, uh, the, the daughters, a family coming apart to come together again, we got marriage for money, uh, uh, a family, how are people going to get along and get inserted into a place that they can inhabit. And that seems to be happening constantly, which is partly why it's so hard to keep track of some of this stuff because people are, they're kind of putting themselves in different holes and then coming out and showing up somewhere else. And uh, they don't know where they're gonna end up either. And I'm sure Dickens is, that's one way to keep us turning the pages and paying the shillings. Exactly, exactly. And that's such a good point because, um, they're all, as we've said, sort of floating around. And we do have a, one of the main characters is someone who said the river, um, which is not far distant from any of the events since all of this sort of is, is being sloshed about by the apparent drowning of John Harmon, the, of the heir to the dustman's fortune. So I think that's, that's correct. And that, that um, he's, he's giving us really a swirl of characters, and he does it so nicely in in the uh, in connecting them with places, uh, the veneerings and their mirrors, pod snaps and the heavy furniture, um, and the large decorative pieces on the table. Uh, those are the we we see that, and Lizzie Hexham with the fire, and uh, I think Abby Abby um, with the uh, uh, with the the drink the warm drink that she serves in the cold. Right, okay, well, we've kind of been pairing and grouping together. Um, so we have, we have Lizzie and her brother and they are at odds about their father. Very much that parallels, doesn't it? The, the um, situation of John Harmon slash Rokesmith and his father's, his relationship with his father. Uh, Bella Wilfer and her relationship with the Will and her mother. Um, any other pairings that you that you think about? Maybe. Is there any type of pairing between the people that are associated with literature, like Charlie and Lizzie, who like to learn how to read? Oh, I'm yes. And, and that's interesting because I think uh, the whole business of uh, becoming literate, and I think Dickens is pushing us to a kind of literacy that involves watching, watching and reading situations and attempting to read people. Uh, right, Charlie is, gonna, is learning to read and, and struggling at it. Uh, Lizzie Hexham right now can't read but she can read her father's behaviors. And so she understands how to, to manage someone who is really of a, of a substantially violent character. Her brother can't do that yet. And she sends him off though to become literate. So I think you're, it's wonderful that you're catching that. And, and she, also, also the man with the wooden leg yes. is oh, yes. literary and he's teaching Yes, yeah. that's Mr. Wegg, and he is, yes, he becomes the uh, interpreter of history for Mr. Boffin. Yeah. And John Rokesmith, as the secretary, becomes the interpreter of business matters for Mr. Boffin as well. And yeah. so, the, so those are very, that's, I think that's an important um, connection. And it may be that we need to think about the, the, the literacy that we are asked to begin to develop or that the characters need to develop to understand each other. Someone was commenting on a place to inhabit so they could get along with one another. And so the, they are, so we're seeing that. And I think we're dealing with this next topic, the characters <clears throat> in relation to the harm and fortune, because that those are all reading the future, their future leave, tea leaves, so to speak, in terms of the of the money or the uh, influence 
that they may or may not that they may or may not uh, enjoy. So, right, I think this is a, a very rich conversation. Um, and, and in it all, of course, is, is uh, the river. And that river, we have to let it be all kinds of things. It could be the River Styx. It could be the Thames River. It could be the River of Life. It could be the Taker of Life. It could be shipping from one place to another as the, if the characters need to go from one place to another. Uh, after all, John Harmon has come by boat. He's traveled uh, by boat. Um, and so the, and we're not sure how, how, um, how, um, oh, I'm sorry, G Eugene uh, has, has gotten there, but he's gotten there by being uh, pushed into law by his father. Um, I would like to, to suggest one thing as we're thinking about that, that uh, maritime and we're thinking about the notions of people. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Lord, uh, Glenda, what do you have to say? Glenda? Glenda, have you got your mic on? Unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. I have to play around with the phone quite a bit. What I wanted to say, I think that this novel has incredibly rich characters, and yes. um, I love the inter the byplay between Boffin and and the scoundrel Silas Wegg. Yes, I think that the car comedy around declining and falling is yes. laugh out loud funny. And the other character I think is so beautifully delineated, though sinister, is Rogue Riderhood. Yes. Um, I think um, I love the way he talks about Tother Governor. Yes. And, um, you know, the way Dickens had the capacity to develop this special language for so many, from Mr. Jingle in Pickwick Papers to Sari Gamp in Martin Chuzzlewit. And now here, right. Dickens has this incredible capacity to um, give voice to, and such idiosyncratic voice to such an array of characters. Right. So I just wanted to mention that that's <clears throat> what is really um, meaningful to me in, and delightful in right. book one. Well, I think that's a, that's a hugely important idea because we are going to hear a cacophony of voices. And one of the things we'll have to do is sort them out too, which are trustworthy and which are not, which are funny, you know, which are funny in a, and in a sinister way, which are funny in a kind way. Uh, Phyllis, and then Liam, I see you. Um, well, going back a little bit to your earlier discussion, um, the, the, the couple that each married each other for money Yes, the, the Lemleys. Yeah. And in a way, when you talk about the relationship to the um, Harmon inheritance, they are a little snapshot of what happens to people that marry an inheritance. Right. And 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 I love the scene when they went to dinner and they were, uh, you know, described as the affectionate couple, the affectionate couple, and then they get in the cab, right. and all pretense is gone. Yeah. And so how many other people are doing the same thing in this world? Right, I, would, I want to come back to that in just a minute. Um, uh, Irene, and then Phyllis. Uh, yeah, I, I was actually going to pick up on the Lamels, Lamels as well because I was mm -hmm. fascinated by the way in which they, having discovered that they both tra tra trapped each other with no money, uh, the way in which that they're inveigling into the pot, pot snaps by g targeting Georgiana, this painfully shy young woman. I'm, I'm look waiting avidly. I can't remember what from previous reading how that one worked out, but I know it's going to interest me all the way through how they latch on to Georgiana and how, the, what, how what their attempts to get money through her. Right. Um, um. Did I miss somebody? Sarah. Yeah, I just want, since you mentioned the river and the importance of river, one thing that I noticed uh, when he accuses Izzy is a little bit uneasy, Lizzie, mm -hmm. uh, she's a bit scared. 
And mm -hmm. her dad said, how can you be scared of the river? This is our, like, uh, uh, almost like she's betraying the river. So yes. it was a little bit about betrayal. But then uh, it shows how, how devoted she is to her brother. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, it was interesting, the discussion about what does, be, what does her dad consider as betrayal? And then we learn about her and how dedicated she is right. to other things, but not to the river, maybe. Right, and we can um, we can go forward in our discussion here a little bit. I have a question. Yes, sorry. Uh, I I've been raising my hand, but I don't. I'm sorry, I did not see you. Yeah, sorry. Um, so the chat the, the book is called the cup and the lip, the cup and the lip. Mm -hmm. And um, what what does that mean? There's a pair there, but I, I'm not quite sure what that means. I know there's one reference to it, but I'm not finding it at the moment. The cup and the lip. Well, there's. I think that's um, part of a fairly popular saying. There's many a slip between the cup and the lip, and so you think you have something to to drink, but don't be so sure because as you put that goblet or that glass or that cup to your lips, you. you may slip it, you may slip and drop it, or it may spill all over you. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Anybody? Uh, Sarah again? Or did we? Not to me. So maybe, okay. yeah. All right. Okay. Anybody else? I don't mean to miss anybody. All right, so let's think about, we've talked about, uh, we've, we've talked about uh, locating the novel in the characters. We've, we've talked about, um, what, let's think about ways of making a living. Because what's interesting here are the numbers of ways. And then I want to make a comment about Mortimer Lightwood. Lightwood. But, so these are the people who are making a living. Okay, and so what are the, the kinds of living, how many of these, oops, sorry. Okay, we've got two folks with the hands. Sila, Sita, Cummings? Yes, Sita, I'm, I'm a little um, late. No, uh, we're glad you're here, we're glad you're well, here. By that I mean, <laughs> I'm a little um, late in my comment because I was, uh, thinking about uh, the pairings. You talked about the pairings and then I, God, I've got a cat that's just driving me crazy here. I'm thinking about pairings in terms of trust. Okay. And I think the theme of trust is very um, ubiquitous in this mm -hmm. first book. Um, and it's, well, let's say Wig Venus. Right, that's that's mm -hmm. just, just a, a blatant uh, Wigs inner dial inner monologue about uh, how he's gonna uh, betray Venus around the the paper copy of the will. Right, and um, there's um, oh I've got so many other examples if I could just think of one of them. Um, of course, there's the trust between uh, John. Mm -hmm. And Bella, he, he doesn't trust her. He has to prove her mm -hmm. uh, before he can trust her. And then, um, well, then there's examples of blind trust uh, where you have Boffin <laughs> signing on with Silas Wegg right. and trusting that he is the man to do the job. And I bet other people could come up with a lot. I mean, there's so many. The two attorneys, now they have an easy relationship to each other that involves, uh, it involves a, a kind of a, a, you know, they're from the same class. Mm -hmm. So there is an ease. Um, and then uh, there's the trust that uh, Lizzie puts in her father. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a it's an uneasy trust, but it's steadfast. Oh, and then there's um, oh, what's her name? Higdon, Betty Higdon. 
she absolutely has not a sh drop of trust right. uh, in, well, you know, her foil is the uh, parish. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'm, I, I invite other people to think about that um, theme because it is, uh, it's, it's uh, potent and, right. it's still, and it's certainly alive and well today. Certainly, certainly. And, and when we take this in the larger uh, context that the, the novel itself is about a trust, something that was left in trust um, to now someone who is apparently dead. And Mr. Boffin has been involved with that trust. And now he has to determine how he's going to make make, make a response to the fact that John Harmon appears to be dead. Yeah, the Lemleys is another funny example yes, yes, of misplaced right. trust. Yeah, yeah. Hi, David. Uh, I was about to talk about the people who trust veneerings. Yes, yes. Whose very name suggests that he's putting up a front, <laughs> but and he's, he's a new man. There were a lot of new Right. people. Nobody knew their background. They got money from somewhere and they were appearing. They worried people. Uh, veneering is busy collecting uh, a social setting of sort of C-list celebrities. Right. And he gets his dinner's worth out of Twemlow by dropping Lord Stingsworthy's name in the course of the dinner, but right. the, the Lambleys believe that veneering has given them information each about the other being well off. Mm -hmm. uh, veneering is, is not a reliable source on anything. Right. He's he's climbing. He's always climbing. Right. But, uh, well, that, he is a surface and he is confused by surfaces, isn't he? He's confused by by the fact that the lam lammies, lamleys, lam lamels look Sophronia and her husband, they look or her uh, beau at the time, they look so presentable and they look so impeccable, but how could there be anything wrong with them? Uh, so, yeah. Okay, Liam? Just in terms of when you're asking about ways in people, ways in which people make their money, mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's a couple of things. One, one is, uh, a lot of the money seems to be coming, being made from from nothing, from stuff that's been rejected, or from stuff that's been rejected by other people. So, so the fortune at the centre, it's not come from gold, it's not come from railways, it's not come from you know, coal mines, it, it's come from from, from dust. Right. Uh, it's, uh, which you kind of, you, 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 you never quite get it clear in your head, what is, what is this bloody dust that they keep talking about? Um, uh, what is this stuff? But it, it's, Clearly, it's not. It's not something which passes, which has uh, like a face value, like you know, like currency. It's it, 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 any value is kind of only emerges after it's been rejected. Um, the, the both Gaffer and Rogue Rider who take stuff that's been well, we we know by now in this story that that sometimes they do a little bit more than they should do, but in theory. They're picking up stuff that's been dumped in the river, things that have been dropped in the river. That's where they got get their income from. I mean, even Betty Higdon is, is taking the rejected children, mm -hmm. um, children that nobody else wants, and, and that's so. There's there's something about the way this society discards things, right? Uh, discards right. things, and, and the fact that I, I, um, uh, perhaps value in them isn't seen. That that's I, I think there's also something about the fact that some. Um, it's not just with the veneering. Some there's a big speech about shares in the middle mm -hmm. of a uh, big right. section about shares in this, uh, and 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 shares are kind of the if you've got shares, you've got a fortune on paper. 
but like tomorrow it can be worth nothing. And there's a sense that some of the values are, are, are not as stable as they seem, uh, like the veneering, the, the lamels, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. Uh, Sita, I think I saw your hand. Yeah, I saw it too, and I realized it was up beyond my desire, <laughs> so I lowered oh, Okay, <laughs> okay. All right, good. I just didn't want to leave, leave anybody out. Great. Okay, excellent. And we think about uh, the river as the source of transportation and, and how people make money and, and uh, all, all of those things. Um, yeah, I think the, the points you're making about making money and how some of it is made from stuff Okay, and uh, discarded stuff, gaffer and and rider, rogue riderhood pick up de de debris from the river, and sometimes that is a debris that's a human debris. Um, right. Um, okay, so think so. Um, Lizzie Hexham helps her father, even though she's bright, she has great skill with the river. She doesn't like it. She's afraid of the of the bodies. Um, so if we were to think, think about that, let's, this, let's just skip. We're kind of going around this. Oops, here we go. Let's think about the, well, there, I'm going back too fast. We did ways of making a living. Okay. Um, okay. Let's think about the female characters so far. Anything more that we want to say about them? Now, I didn't put uh, Mrs. Boffin on there so we can add her. I would like you to consider three names here. Uh, Lizzie and Betty and Bella. These are all variants of Elizabeth. Uh, the Bella being a short for Isabella, which is a, a, a European variant for Elizabeth. And it's interesting that they are uh, that they are variants of Elizabeth. Um, the two figures in the Bible who are named Elizabeth. One was, of course, the cousin to Mary and the mother of John the Baptist in the New Testament. And the other one, uh, that, that um, Elizabeth was um, one of the daughters of Moses, not Moses. Um, I think that's right. I'll have to look that up because I... I lost it there in my talking. But so we've got Elizabeth, Bet, Betty Higgins on there twice. Sorry about that. Uh, so, we, and Bet, so we've got Elizabeth, Lizzie, and Bella, and they're all variants of Elizabeth. So what one wonders if they are a variance of one another. We don't know. So if you think about those characters, those three, Lizzie, Betty, and Bella, can we see now we don't see it, but just from book one. Now, not not leaping ahead. What do we see that might be? Uh, are they going in uh, similar, different directions? Uh, we have two of them that are clearly uh, not wealthy: Lizzie and Betty. Uh, Bella. And notice their names, Lizzie Hexham. Okay, uh, very. There's a magical name there, uh, uh, Hex and Am. Uh, Bella Wilfer, very will, full of will. Okay. Anything to think about when we say Betty Higdon? Not sure. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Dickens doesn't let us go too easily with playing games with names, although naming was significant to him. Okay. 
Kathy has her hand up. Oh, quite, okay, yes. Who, who does? Kathy. Oh. Yeah, okay. I would say that, <clears throat> I mean, they're all, all three of those characters, uh, even though Bella, Bella starts out as poor and she hates being poor. Right. And so all three of them are, you know, poor. And in many ways, Bella, you know, has this drive to, right. uh, you know, <laughs> to improve her circumstances. Right. In many ways, Lizzie does too, because she, she does it indirectly through her brother. Right. She, right. she want, you know, she wants him to be literate, which means that he would move up in class. Right. And Betty, um, you know, by taking in these orphans, um, she wants a better life for them. Right. Um, and, you know, Lizzie and, and Bella are alike in that, or Lizzie and Betty are alike in that they, they do it, um, they, you know, they, they reach for a higher status through others. And in a way, Bella does too, because she, you know, she be, she just became rich at five by being at a park with her mother. Uh, and so, um, but she's now driven by it. She wants, you know, she wants the coach, she wants money, she wants dresses. And she even wants it for her father when she gives him that little purse and says, go and get great clothes and come back to me and show me that you're in these like very great clothes. So there, there's parallels in all three of them. Right, right. Okay, uh, so what do we make of Mrs. Milby? She is the pastor's wife in the, in the Betty Higdon chapter. And Dickens was very, um, uh, he was not ashamed at all to express the contempt he had for the British clergy, not at all. But this is the one couple, the clergy couple that he has enormous respect for. And we see them as bringers of order. We see them as bringers of legitimate compassion. And so not yet, but we see them as attempting to find order and they're, they're they're part of that search theme. In this case, they're trying to find the right, the right orphan that can be, um, that can be adopted. She's the mother of several kids. She's uh, working high. Uh, yes, Phyllis. Well, what all of these also have in common is that they are trying to um, achieve their goals um, outside of the quote unquote normal path of marriage or okay. couplehood or uh, a quote unquote nuclear family, whatever that might be in those days, uh, either through uh, being a substitute mother or uh, you know ha having a father who uh, Lizzie adores but must defy and therefore let the Charlie become the father of the family. Um, and Mrs. Milby is, um, you know, Larry, um, married to um you know a father right, right? yes um so it's uh but it's not a her father so mm -hmm. and and they are treated with incredible respect i was again the boffins i thought were going to be made fun of and then the milbys and suddenly she's a thoughtful handsome woman and right. so i think dickens is again trying to stir the pot with roles and uh expectations that come with them uh it's happening to the characters the same way it's happening to us. It's, yeah. it's like a ph phenomenological thing, right? It's suffusing the text. Um, right. So we're living their experience. Yes, I think so. I think that's why the book has a continuous interest for us. Uh, David. Um, going back to Bella for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, we get her in her family. She's closer to her father than to right. her mother. Right. And I would add to this list the name of Lavinia, her sister. Oh, yes. Okay, good. Closer to the mother than the father. And Lavinia takes her mother's values and mm -hmm. is what Bella might become, might have become 
mm -hmm. if her circumstances hadn't changed. Right. Right. That's true. That's true. Right. Okay. Great, great conversation about the female characters that we have met. Um, and let's go on. We're going to look. I think we may have already managed this, but just to be. Oh, no, here. The female characters. Let's think about the male characters. Okay, here they are. Well, let's go. And let's use these for ways of making a living, except for Betty. Okay, so we've got female characters. I think this is pretty much all of the <coughs> male characters, right? And think about the partnerships, too. We'll take Betty out of there. So. so we've got Gaffer and his connection to Rogue Riderhood, right? A Rogue Riderhood insists they're part partners. Uh, Gaffer says no, not particularly. Uh, Silas Wegg is connected to Mr. Venus, but they are not exactly partners. Hi, Glenna. Yes. And, and uh, Glenna. I wanted, to, you're talking about various male characters. Yes. I've already said my fondness for uh, some of them. And uh, I guess it was David that was talking about the veneerings, but yes. uh, Mr. Veneering is just such a powerful symbol of what, of the kind of individual that uh, economic change is throwing up and making prominent. Right. And in uh, the scenes of the veneerings entertaining are, incredibly um how, how should i put this incredibly vivid yeah. incredibly telling about social interactions and just one little curious factoid for me um many many years ago i read the remembrance of things passed by proust and proust and i don't have exact recollection because it was many years ago but in that novel there are these um people who represent I think something rather similar, and their character, their names are the Verdurin, E-E-R-D-U-R-I-N, and um, I googled veneering Verdurin, uh -huh. and I found out that um, Proust, there's a school of um, interpretation that thinks that Proust was very influenced by our mutual friend wow. in creating his characters, so that what I'm trying to suggest is that the veneerings and Mr. Veneering in particular are such a perfect um, encapsulation of, mm -hmm. of, a, of a type, of a, right. of a new man, of new money, of social climbing, of right. uh, the attempt to have these social events that will make enough of a mark on society that, um, you know, that they will establish this, the new money's position in society. Right. that uh, they influenced a great foreign writer as well. Yes, that's interesting. Thank you for, for telling us about that. Uh, and what interests me about Mr. Veneering is the notion that he is all surface. You know, I mean, he is, he's the veneer of the veneer. So it's yeah. the reflection of the veneer. So he's a thinner surface than even the veneer. Uh, and that takes us to Mr. Lamel, Lamel, who is a laminar flow is just a very few, uh, just a very few even cells wide. And so he is the laminar flow that's even uh, like a walking, like a walking reflection with no substance except his own, his own uh, prideful desire to survive behind it. So David, what have you got? Oh. Uh. If we're looking at the male characters, we can divide them into lower class. Yes. And above that, mm -hmm. lower class characters do something. The upper class characters mostly don't. Uh, some of them illustrate how to live on nothing a year. Right. Uh, Mortimer and Eugene presumably are getting subsidized by their parents mm -hmm. since they're not making money through the law. You've got the upper class characters are mostly insubstantial mm -hmm. in terms of 
what do they do and how do they get money? Right. All right. We're not sure what Mr. Veneering's business is, nor are we sure what PodSnap's business is. Right. Now, uh, that's, that's an excellent point. I'm glad you're reminding us of that. Uh, Phyllis. Um, well, that, I was just about to say we can't end this discussion without referring to PodSnap. Yeah. Um, and um, the, that once again, Dickens does a great job of using repetition to mm. um, make a point, right? The, the uh, what is it, breakfast at nine, going to the city at 10, coming home at half past five and dining at seven, music right. yes. and going right. on and on. And um, it was not a very large world morally, no, nor even geographically. Right. Uh, and he, Mr. Posnap has no idea why anyone wouldn't be content. Um, and and then the young rocking horse being trained in her mother's art of prancing in a stately manner without ever getting on. Yes, right. um, that made me think of what um, uh, 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 Hillary Mantel said of Kate. <laughs> that she was a. <laughs> um, so I, I I just want to throw that in. I'm glad we got to PodSnap, but I think that's a very important yeah. uh, and of course became a word like Kleenex. So it obviously mm -hmm. struck a lot of nerves. But yeah. Right, right. I'm glad you're call he's not on that list, and I'm glad you're calling calling our attention to him because his attitudes about propriety and let nothing uh put a uh blush on the face of the of the young child is it is something that's sort of hanging around actually a little bit in the 21st century. So, right. Uh, Phyllis. I, I lowered my hand, I'm done, <laughs> thank you. Okay. All right, okay, okay. So if we look at these, um, we see the, as, as David suggested, let's divide them into upper and lower. Mr. Venus is a kind of artist. He makes shapes uh, out of, out of, makes an order of, of various sorts. Gaffer Hexham. Gaffer Hexham is an interesting character to me because he is a, he is a, un, an unhealthy notion of being a fisher of men. He's literally a fisher of men. And uh, the whole business of boats and fishing is an important motif in the New Testament um, where the disciples are told at, in two different situations, let down your nets and see what you find. And so they let down the nets and they find uh, more fish than they can manage. But in this case, um, with the letting down of the net doesn't catch the, the living, the living uh, substance, but it catches a dead substance by which people can at least uh, come to feed themselves. So it's an it's a an interesting twist on notions of uh, uh, spiritual or religious um, uh, self sustainment. Um, Mr. Venus is the creator. He's the maker of order, but he also loses pieces. He apparently has lost part of Silas Wegg's leg or some part of Silas Wigg, and he's not, he, the, Mr. Wigg is not, sh not happy, and Venus is confused because his beloved thinks that he, uh, he, she can't marry him or be interested in him because of his, because of his livelihood. Uh, Mortimer Lightwood is an interesting character to me, uh, simply because of his name. We've talked about lots of uh, boating, lots of finding a place for yourself so you don't uh, perhaps go under in a, in a social system that is all surface, difficult to see, perhaps all mirrors uh, with no substance in it, uh, or too heavy, to, to almost too substantial. And there's an interesting business about what is insubstantial and what is almost too substantial to, to encourage a growth. But if you look at Mortimer's name, and I have been fascinated by the names Dickens gives his characters because he took some time. Uh, Mortimer in French is Mortimer. 
Okay. <laughs> right, dead in the water. Okay. But yet he's light wood, you see. So he's the light wood that might be dead in the water, but he can float. I don't know about that. A long time ago, I just made that up. <laughs> and you, Eugene Rayburn, okay, may be burning his bridges behind him. Okay. The name, and this is a far-fetched thing, but I read about names when I was finishing my uh, dissertation. And Eugene comes to be suggestive to, to suggest a wealthy, a young person, wealthy young man. And if we think about the young man in the New Testament, he comes and he says, what must I do to be saved? I've done this, I've done that. Of course, Eugene hasn't done anything. And he's told to uh, sell all you have. Well, Eugene hasn't collected anything, so he has nothing to sell yet. And yet his, his interest in Lizzie is astonishing. And if we think about Eugene and Lizzie, and we're going a little bit, uh, pulling back a little bit, connecting the ways of making a living with the characters, of the, with the characters' other lives, um, he is astonished by her capacity to be uh, uh, substantial but not in the sub substance of Pontiac. And so that, that substance, she has great essence and substance. And uh, he's, pick, pick, he's finding that uh, as she is, she is the daughter and yet the one who will sustain her father uh, and her brother if he will let her. Okay. So the, these making, this business of making a living Lizzie is help, helping to make the living. Betty Higdon is helping babies to make a living. Uh, as we said, uh, Miss Abby is making a living, but she's also watching out for the health of the job of the fellowship by kicking both uh, Hexham and Riderhood out. So we see very interesting uh, patterns in the characters as we begin to think about them um, a little bit differently. And so we, and we have the, 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 the women that are going to be around uh, John Rokesmith as well. And we include then Mrs. Boffin. And if we think about the Boffin's house, let's, uh, if we think about the dwellings of the, of, the, of the people, and I don't have a slide for that, so we can imagine that though. My intention was to let this conversation go where it might. So if we think about the dwellings, we've talked already about the, about the veneerings. We've talked about the pot snaps. We've talked about the not especially attractive uh, dwelling of the Hexums, but that Lizzie finds she has food and she has at least some light and some warmth. Um, Betty Higdon at least has a home for the orphan and for the and the minders whom she's caring for. It may not be spectacular, but she at least has a home. Martimer and Eugene share quarters uh, of living. They have they share a space. Uh, we don't know how big that space is. So we see the the uh, Miss uh, Mrs. Wilfer and her husband share a small enough home but it's large enough for them to have the border. And so the border then comes and lives in their downstairs area. So they have a home that will get them uh, some income, but at the same time, they have a daughter that may lift them out. So the whole issue of dwelling and home and place of work uh, becomes, becomes connected uh, in, this, in this particular novel in ways that I'm not sure uh, takes place in others, except perhaps the prison environment in Little Dorrit and the split between, um, the split in Bleak House between the city and the green world of uh, Chesney Wold. So those are things that are just of interest to me as we, as we look at these, that we look at these characters and we begin to see how many 
uh, different ways that they connect. And of course, the lamels are going to end up on that disastrous honeymoon, but then they come right back. And we're going to see uh, before we finish here that they are going to be able to be the perfect vultures as they go after the Georgina fox net. Okay, so here, this is from a, a lovely, I'm so glad, I think Wayne, you're responsible for the Bodenheimer article. I've read a good bit from Professor Bodenheimer. Um, uh, plots and deceptions are conduced in the present and managed by the characters in full view of the reader. The novel, a big book written about making money and possibly for the need of money. So let's think for a minute about currency and the plots and deceptions that are in the book. I think that should be our conducted, conduced, I don't know what word that is. I think that should be plots and deceptions are conducted in the present. Okay. So if we think about the plots and the deceptions, we can start with either side, plots and de or deceptions. Which shall we start? Or we can just start somewhere. What are some of the plots? Not as in the plot of the novel, but the plots of the characters. Oh, Rahul? Mm -hmm. Well, the first one is, of course, um, Rook, Rooksmith, you know, Rooksmith being several people at once. That's sort of the beginning right. of it. And second, uh, the plot of um, Ryder. Oh, gosh, these names give me a hard time. But anyway, the. Ryder Hurt. Yeah, Hex was partner uh, against uh, and trying to get that money, that 10,000 uh, pounds. And plotting to uh, implicate Hexham, you know, and that whole thing. And then they go and I guess you'd call it a kind of a plot that some somehow or other, and it's pretty, pretty sneaky. I mean, it's, I'm wondering exactly how Hexham died and if that was a murder, you know. Right. So that's a plot that we've got. And right. then we have some of the, then we have the Lamleys that you were just talking about plotting against Geor Georgina. Right. Uh, I mean, there are more plots than you can throw your hands up, I guess, at, actually. Yes, yeah. Those are, those are a few. Those are a few. Right, and and they are they're going to get more complicated uh, as the novel proceeds when we proceed into books books two and three. So we're seeing someone has said earlier in our conversation finding a place to live, creating a place to live, uh, making a place to live, making a place, and some of these plots and deceptions are conducted uh, and managed by the characters. Uh, to, in order to do that. Uh, Bella Wilfer agrees to go to live with the Boffins. Um, we don't know exactly why, except that she will get away from, from what she imagines to be the dismal situation of her home, and she will have pretty dresses to wear, so we know that. Um, what's the plot Mrs. Boffin is trying to hatch? Irene, and then um, I don't know if I'd call it a plot that. Uh, uh, sorry, who, Mrs. Who did you say? I'm, my, my, Mrs. Boffin. Mrs. Boffin. I don't know if I'd call it a plot, but uh, to some extent, you seem to be trying to compensate for some feelings of guilt about the way in which they've come into the inheritance. Yes. So she's looking at helping Bella because Bella's the one who suffered by Rooks, by uh, young Harmon di apparently dying and she's not right. able to marry him and beca get become wealthy and well off. Right. And similarly, they want to adopt an orphan because they feel so bad about the way in which the young John Harmon was treated by his father, which they saw when they were involved with the, the Harmon father. So. Right. The, the, I wouldn't call it a plot, but a plan. Their pl okay. plan is to try and do good with some of the money they've acquired in order to compensate for the way in which they acquired it. Oh, I think that's a good dis, dis, uh, distinction between plot and plan, uh, because that's correct. And, and it's, a, it's a, a kind and, and generous plan as well. 
Okay, good. Any other? We've got the Lamels plot. Yeah, right. I think, excuse me, I think you can add uh, Lizzie's plot to secure an education for her little brother, Charlie. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, she, she has, she even has a little bit of money and some food for him to leave that very next morning so that when a gaffer comes back, which of course he doesn't, uh, she can explain it to him in a way that uh, Charlie would not suffer from the uh, perhaps vicious anger of his father. Right. Good. Any other plots? A Kathy. Good. Thank you. I'm not seeing those. Thank you. All right, Kathy, did you have something to add? I think you just talked talk with us, right? Mute. Okay, Mortimer's plot to um, somehow, I'm not sure he knows in the beginning, but he likes Lizzie. Mm -hmm. And um, you can see it in the very beginning when he disappeared. <laughs> and he's obviously going over to her house. Um, but, um, and you know, that goes throughout the entire book. Yes, right, yeah. I think that's Eugene, right, that leaves. No, I think it, anyway. One or the sure. other. I'm not sure, but you know, there, I, yeah. Yeah, but he does, he has, he's fascinated by her and he is perhaps plotting how to, uh, we see that plot develop as we go forward. Okay, um, any other plots? or plans. So we have a book, oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just gonna say Lizzie Hexham certainly has a long range plan. Yes, and why, why do you think that is? She's gonna get her brother away from dad and then. I'm, did I say Lizzie Hexham? I didn't mean to. I meant to say Betty Higdon. Yeah. <laughs> they, yes. they are very much connected. I mean, after all, Lizzie is is at uh, Betty's side when she dies. I mean, yeah. it's like a it's like a, a spiritual uh, transcendence of some sort. So, but anyway, um, Betty uh, Higdon has a long term plan. She's got all the pieces in place, ready to be launched, and she succeeds. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. But then she succeeds because um, Lizzie really promises she really makes her solemnly promise to um be true to the plan right right that's true that's true right okay so if we have the we've got plots if we just summarize for a minute we have people finding trying to find a place to a place to uh, to make for themselves we have uh ways of making money we have a long collection of female and male characters that are going about things, some in the same way and some in different ways. And we have a situation of extraordinary danger on the river. And yet in society, there is an equal danger of the mirror that turns everything into reflection and reflected reality. And poor Mr. Twemlow can't figure out whose best friend he is or how many of the best friends Veneering has. And then Podsnap is so heavy and, and determined in his sense of values that he may miss the danger to his daughter uh, from the Lam Lamleys who seem to be, or Lamels who seem to be uh, such pleasant people on the outside. Uh, so, okay, and we have, of course, they are uh, direct plots. So let's see. Okay. So we had more questions. We've talked about locations. We've talked about importance of making a living. Any other questions that you can uh, think of that we, we think about, let's stop for a minute and think about the locations. We have Lizzie Hexham on the river. We have 
John Rokesmith coming from the river. We have Mortimer and Eugene as the storytellers telling us of the man from somewhere who becomes the man from nowhere in the initial Veneering's party. We have um, the location of Lizzie's home. We have the Wilfer's home. We have the interesting description of the Boffin's home as two places in one where Mr. Boffin has his part all organized and decorated in the way he wants it to be. And Mrs. Boffin has hers. They're moving from that location into the city. And any other, and then the general location of the river. Anything else? Yes, I'd say, I'd say that Twimlow's uh, dwelling, it's it, totally metaphoric, but he's in storage with the table. Yes. And uh, he's the nobility. He's the nobility, which must have been confused at all this nouveau yes. power coming right. up all around them from sources questionable. Yes. Yes, he can't understand it because there's no family line. There's no uh, generational issue there. Right. And we're told the wonderful way that the, that the, we're told the wonderful way that the Veneerings plan a, plan a uh, dinner party. Yeah. They have, they, they, here's Mr. Twemlow one leaf, and then can they make him into 20 leaves by adding uh, all of the other care of the other people who might come and, and then those who refuse to come uh, and they find other people to take up those leaves uh, with Mr. Twemlow being sort of at the center, the center leaf in the table, but always ending up at the very farthest away from the, from the, uh, from the center of the table. Yeah, he, he's become expedient. Yes. Um, so, and, and those leaves are, um, oh God, what did I want to say? Um, the, well, it's society. The table itself is society. Right. So. It's simply be, it's being stuck together with, right. with uh, some order, but, um, but not, not an order that is, uh, hi, Phyllis, go ahead. Hi, Phyllis, go ahead. Um, it's, it's also, um, Dickens does this elsewhere um, very well, but the um, animation of the inanimate um, yeah. to express what the people are doing. And right. so you have the leaves of the table, you have the furniture of the veneerings. And then I think it's the, the, the fellowships bar with yeah. the, the, the trunk that has the knobs coming out and the... Yeah. Um, and, and all sorts of, there, there are architectural details where um, I think it's Venus's uh, desk is, is so short that you actually can see the fireplace. And, yeah. and it's, it's as if, it, it's, it's like uh, when the forest starts singing, you know, in the Wizard of Oz or something, yeah. or, right. or in Greek, right. or the metamorphoses. It's like right. all these stable, solid things are living around you, you know, it's, uh, reflecting the life. I guess it's like they're all so tightly bound that they become animated as well. Right, right. That's a, that's a grand point and a, a, a good idea for us to, to think about as we go forward in reading the novel. And that is the, the animation of the animation of inanimate, the mysterious animation of inanimate things, which is, is it, as you said, an important issue in Dickens. Um, so we have that air element that's connected to space, that's connected to making a living, that's connected to finding value. As, as Twemlow can't find his value, he doesn't know if he's the best friend or the third best friend or how many best friends Veneering has. It comes up, it seems that he has, when they're counting up the, the dinner party for the Lamels, Lamleys, the, the uh, you know, he doesn't know how many. And he says, oh, there's one of us. Now there's six of us. Now there are eight of us that are the best friends. So are the friends. And then he's deposited back, as you say, above the livery stable to be carted out again, dressed up in old-fashioned dress and to take his place. Now that's going to change uh, at the end of the novel because uh, uh, the, the end of the novel 
Twemlo finds his voice and and makes a clear statement about what's been going on. That's uh, very interesting. We also have Lady Tippins. We haven't talked about her with her book full of uh, imaginary lovers that she adds to and crosses off as, as, as her imagination and vanity uh, uh, encourage her or the situation encourage her. Any, th any other questions here? So uh, Wayne, yes. Wayne yes. and then Jane Ann. Yes. Uh, am I audible? You are, mm -hmm. yes. Oh, great. Thank you. Well, this goes back part way, but Eugene and Mortimer share lodgings. Yes. They share rooms. And we're told at one point they had been friends ever since they'd been boys together at school. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't know. There's a few scenes of... Uh, physical intimacy there that may go yeah. under the radar, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But the Eugene Mortimer relationship is a prototype for the buddy plots mm -hmm. of which there were many. I think 19, uh, 2018 Academy Award was for the Green Book. Yes, yeah. Which is a classic buddy plot. And if you want to see a very funny buddy plot about California's wine country, uh, see Sideways. But anyway, I think that Mortimer is too lightweight, so to speak, on Eugene, because in a lot of buddy plots, the more reserved a serious partner exerts a beneficial, beneficial influence on the wild one. Mm -hmm. Although sometimes the wild car, uh, partner has something to give back mm -hmm. to the more staid member. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Oh, I think that gives us much to think about. Kathy? Yeah, Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Unmute. I'm I guess. think I'm yeah. gonna go next. I'm Jane Ann. Okay, good. Yeah, one question that I've sort of been pondering is not just where you live, but who's in your family? Because we start with some family units that are dissolving. And I'm really curious what new families will be created. Um, earlier in the discussion when someone was talking about the Boffins, to me, they're trying to create a new family. It's like a family they didn't have, but sort of wanted. And I think uh, a lot of the other characters are going to, like the Hexams, that the family that we start with in this first section is going to fall apart and something new will probably take its place. Right, right. I think, I think uh, you're right in that. And, and of course, if we've read the Further into the novel, we already know that that's go that's going to happen, and I, but I think Dickens sets it up so nicely that we can tell um, those those aspects that are uh, beginning to shake a little bit as the as the as the experience of the characters goes forward. I think that's I think that's very good. It's where you live and who's in your family, and uh, and how that's how those things are going to work out. Right. right. The, the, the family you're born with and the family you choose. Exactly. Yes, the family you choose, the family you make. Right. That's good. That's a good point. Right. Um, Lena, did I miss somebody? Uh, <clears throat> okay. I wanted to follow up on what Wayne was saying about um, the <clears throat> Eugene and uh, Mortimer. And mm -hmm. um, I was very struck by what you pointed out about Mortimer's last name. Mm -hmm. They seem really two of a kind, but then after uh, we find out that Gaffer, Gaffer's uh, demise, mm -hmm. then we see the difference between the two men. Mortimer yeah. has absolutely zippo interest in what's going to become of Lizzie, mm -hmm. and Eugene immediately uh, mm -hmm. shows that he has a caring heart because he's worried about her. Yeah. And so, um, you know, Lightwood is uh, 
as a very good name for a character right who um is is light he doesn't have any moral heft and even though eugene and he are bantering and eugene is talking about uh, you know his father in a disparaging way mm -hmm. it turns out he does have some moral heft right right that's true and even though eugene's um attentions toward lizzie might at first be fairly um a matter of indeterminate value of his uh, of his um curiosity he's not met someone like her and he's also t t taken with her beauty so we can't tell anything much about that except that he wants to be watching, watching her and taking care of her i think somebody else's hand was up there did we did i miss you david um a victorian reader from who'd read other novels that go into the theater mm -hmm. would have in mind the possibility that Eugene is going to seduce Lizzie right. and then abandon her. Mm -hmm. The reader is probably saying in the back of his mind, but Mr. Dickens wouldn't do that. But it's definitely something that would be a possibility. Yes. In the reader's right. anticipation. Right. Yeah. Uh, we can think of at least one character in David Copperfield who does that, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So, what else have we not talked about, or where, looking forward, what would you like to continue? What uh, other directions would you like to take as we talk about book, book two next month? And book three after that. What would you like to add to the conversations? Anything? Anything else? If you've uh, read the book already, you may have something that you just really would like for us to touch on. Can I? Can I cut in? Absolutely. Okay, great. I'm really intrigued by the dust mounds. I don't quite understand them. There's this passage that I can't find where Mr. Boffin says, well, you've got your ashes and you've got your other stuff <laughs> that it consists of. But I'm there are two other novels that I loved. Um, one is by the Canadian writer Margaret Lawrence called The Diviners. Mm -hmm. And her, the father of the protagonist is a garbage man. Mm -hmm. And the garbage figures, Christy, his name is, and he and the, he can divine the garbage. He can read the garbage. He can tell you anything that's going on in the entire town by what they throw out. You know, so it's a real symbol of humanity, really, you know, or what we become. And then there's a Margaret Drabble novel, and I think it's The Middle Ground, where Drabble uses... Um, I th there's another character who's a garbage man, maybe her father. Um, and she uses that as the artist spins shit to gold. <laughs> if okay. he, if he keeps coming back to shit to gold. Um, that out of this muck, you know, comes this artistic vision. But I don't really understand what it is in this novel. It's, it's really intriguing. It's physically there. It's looming. It's mm -hmm. the source of money. And of course, I always think of dust to dust and ashes to ashes. I mean, it's that kind of mortality gook, you know, <laughs> that we're made of and that money is made of. Um, but I don't kind of, it doesn't have that clear meaning to me that it had in those other two novels. Um, I think it's the middle ground. They're both wonderful novels, if you've got spare time. Um, Margaret Drabble and Margaret Lawrence. Um, anyway, I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. Okay, well, we'll be we'll be very much into the into the mounds as we go through book two and th two and three. Those actually were mounds of dust, uh, garbage, dust and dust and all kinds of things, and they were separated. They would go into separating areas where the uh, things of value would be separated out and then uh, sold, uh, and the people who were doing that 
uh, were, were making uh, large sums of money off what was what could be uh, reconstructed out of the out of the trash, basically. And uh, so, it, but we'll look, let's look at that more. That's that's a great idea. Tell us what you have. Well, I recall I think it was Old Curiosity Shop mm -hmm. when they're making their way out of London, and and um, there's all sorts of uh, mounds and piles and fiery furnaces and dust and coal um, it uh, and I guess it's in that case it's more the industrialization which has the word dust in it um, of of the countryside but um, and one has to recall that um, the mud mm -hmm. in London streets and Dickens is right. horse manure it's yes. not mud <laughs> um, so there was a lot of dirt around. <laughs> right. Yes, and and it was it was a uh, you know a significant int a significant problem. We can think of the typhoid, um, the typhoid epidemic in 1854, which was caused by contamination of the Thames, and of course the Thames was contaminated by all by all the gook that was going on going into the river from London and then being pulled back into the water through the water supply. So, right. Okay, good. Great. Other things. That's wonderful. What Karen? Else? Yes. Oh, uh, Karen Kleeman. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> um, I'm thinking that it would be, this is back to Gail's comment mm -hmm. about um, the dust mounds. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people are familiar with Henry Mayhew's right. um, seminal work. He was a pioneer in terms of social investigation and contributed wonderfully as a journalist to understanding the working poor in the 1850s, 60s of um, London. Mm -hmm. The name of his book is London Labor and London Poor. And it's a composite of his interviews and his observations as a journalist of all the working poor, but lots about rag pickers and dust mount, how you could find enough coins sometimes mm -hmm. in these dust piles to really become quite wealthy. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something I would like to focus on the context of the working poor and this whole scavenger notion of um, how people had to go through garbage to live. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Okay. Anyone else? We've got a few minutes. As we think about the, the poor, uh, we can also think about uh, Betty, Betty Higdon because she will become uh, central. I don't remember if it's in book two or three uh, in her flight from the uh, the poorhouse. So, uh, and of course, Lizzie Hexham is certainly low income. Hi, Phyllis. I'm almost embarrassed to ask this because we may have actually talked about this at the very beginning, okay. or this may be so obvious that. Um, so, who is our mutual friend? Ah, well, <laughs> who knows? Let's let's talk about that next time. Okay. Right now, it may be John Harmon is our mutual friend. Uh, but you right. see, the issue for Mr. Twemlow is who are the mutual relatives? And then when the when the uh, when they're trying to plan the wedding party for the lam lamels, you know, they can't get enough mutual friends to come uh, because these right. people don't have any name value, and so they right. end up with with. Uh, people pretty far down the list to come. So, right, I think that whole business of mutual friend. Mutual and value. also, I think the phrase mutual friend is one that um, is going for um, garnering trust again, yeah. like we both know him or her right. and so. Which of course, in the, way, uh, in the way that the veneerings and the pod snaps use it, that's not the case at all. They don't even know the people um, so that Mr. Podsnap is actually introduced, I think, to Twimlow as Mr. Veneery. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then they have to straighten that out. Hi, hi, Phyllis. What's your idea? Well, it is anonymous. 
the term mm -hmm. is has an anonymity right. to it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it, it also sounds like what gangsters say to each other. <laughs> right. Yes, right. Our, I know our mutual friend you guys told me that right. we should meet behind the church at twelve o'clock, you know. Right. Yeah. Part of the family. Yes, sir. I have a mutual friend who can uh, take care of your problem for you. Right. We have right. Uh, right. Oh, I'm sorry, Gail. Yeah. Well, when I, I think of the term mutuality and how interconnected a Dickens novel is, the interconnected sort of to a fault, you know, everybody's related to everybody else. <laughs> I mean, there are only 25 people in London and they all know each other or, right. you know, are related. But it's a really, it seems a very important part of his vision, this, uh, the interconnection of society that, you know, we are all mutually dependent right. on one another. And and the the thing that strikes me in that pod snap, the little bit about pod snappery mm -hmm. and his vision of, well, we don't have any responsibility for the poor. If they're poor, that's their problem. It's right. not our problem. And the utter, you know, irresponsibility of the upper class, the disconnection, the unmutuality at that level, mm -hmm. whereas at the, it were, and that's impossible. I mean, that's suicidal because society is interconnected. And Dickens usually shows, I think, this stuff is catching up with people when they imagine they're yes, right. not mutual, yes. you know, that right. they're an island unto themselves. Yeah. Above, above it all. Yeah, he's so good on bringing the, bringing the mighty down anyway. Mm -hmm. right. um, I love that about his vision, that the mutuality, the, yes. the interconnection of, of um, society. Um, right. Because right. it's yeah. something yes. we've lost, of course. That's right. And uh, um, we see that to an extreme in Christmas Carol, but we also see it. Uh, I think we're, we'll see that mutuality here as well. Hi, uh, Ray. Yeah, I, I think this is a very broad one, but big motivation in that deception is often you 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 profess or you you fake love mm -hmm. when your real motive is to get money. And yeah. so I think that's kind of kind of an interesting overall theme too. We talked about connectivity, the ultimate connectivity, but that money disguises the connectivity and people use the money to try to in, they pretend to offer love and trust and in fact they're trying to get money and that goes on in so many relationships in, in these Dickens novels right um, so I think keeping an eye on that you know another person mentioned trust and I think that too is a really interesting um, subject to think more about so right right now it's and it's I'm glad you mentioned that because that calls to my mind uh, an observation from uh, that when the Lam Lamleys are Lamels are um, courting Georgiana Podsnap. Sophronia has taken her away from the group and they are sitting having the conversation where uh, Sophronia's all smiled, my darling Georgiana, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And her husband comes and he stands next to her chair and leans over and touches her bracelet, touches something on her arm. And she, uh, is suddenly attentive, and we're told that the that she understands from his behavior and his position that ne this is something that she can play. This is a game she can play. Oh yeah. In and so, so they are while they are very, very uh, distant from one another, but they are they are communicating terrifyingly well. And so, of course, they begin the the, the uh, operation Georgiana uh, between them. So, yeah, right. very good. Okay, I like the ideas. Um, Gail, Gail, did we hear from you? Yeah, I okay. I, pretty, but that <clears throat> just to follow up on the money, money uh, becoming the connective between human and human. That's Marx. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. I mean, it's Karl Marx got that from him, I guess. I, yeah. I don't know the dates. So I don't know who got what from who, but right. when money becomes the, uh, the 
whatever. Well, the, the, right, and we can the bomb. Exactly. When we can think and about the shift I, in I, British economy from the agrarian wealth of land and buildings of the of the old nobility to the 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 money that was developed by investing capital in factories mm -hmm. and investing capital in hiring laborers, laborers to work in factories and even to the point of building factory towns um, instead of the villages growing around the estates of the well-to-do and the villages then prospering because of the agricultural products that were produced on the various estates. Um, these are now towns, we see that in um, hard times, the towns that are built for the factory workers uh, to work in. And that, that is that they, they are the capital, but that's a very different uh, way to think about, it, about the uh, people as a capital investment. So that's different. And of course, Sophronia and her husband had actually thought about one another as capital investments. And that <coughs> makes their mistake so horrifying and so amusing at the same time. And Bella does. She yes. says she wants an estate, yeah. right. <laughs> not a husband. <laughs> Right, right. That's true. And there is, um, you know, there's there's always commentary about um, Roke Smith's deliberate um, uh, his his deliberate disguise to as John Harmon uh, into John Roke Smith and his testing Bella to see if she is. A money grubber or if she has other value to him that's almost a capital transaction not quite but we can think about how differently that works than say Lamel's uh courtship of Sophronia uh, because they are how how is this uh, working and what when we meet fascination Fledgeby uh and Mr. Raya as fascination I can't say that fast. Can you say that fast five times? No. Fascination Fledgeby is after Georgiana for contact with her father. And so, you know, how how those kinds of situations, but the Lamels are the most interesting to, at this point to me. They might not be interesting to me three weeks from now, but um, because they made this capital agreement un, un, without meaning to. They did not mean to make that, although they each thought the other had money. So they they did mean to mean it on one on one hand. And then now they are in a capital enterprise, the two of them. So well, as I see the clock on the wall, uh, we are almost to five. And uh, any close, any closing comments? I hope you have not found the the two hours tedious. Um, and I'm glad you came and I've loved the conversation and uh, enjoyed it really and I have all kinds of notes here that's why I love these these uh, uh, discussions because I always I feel my my head is going to explode with new ideas and new things to think about so thanks so much um, are we uh, Courtney are we ready to to adjourn I think we are okay well, thanks very much, everybody. I appreciate your coming in. Thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Yeah, it was. That was yeah. Yeah. wonderful. It's only wonderful because you were here. Only wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, everyone.